Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to have um, this presentation that is supported by the Black Research Support Network. And so I'd like to start by introducing our speaker. So Dr. Yolanda A. Rankin is an associate professor in the School of Information at Florida State University. She's a recent recipient of the NSF Early Career Award, and it is the largest in FSU, Florida State University's history. Dr. Rankin's research interests include applying Black feminist epistol, see, I thought I had it when I think about it. Epistemologies as critical frameworks for designing technology with marginalized or underserved populations and developing strategies for broadening participation in K through 16 computing education. In addition, she's a McKnight Fellow and a Woodrow Wilson Fellow, having published more than 40 peer reviewed publications, including journal articles and conference papers presented at top tier ACM and IEEE conferences. Prior to academia, she accumulated more than 15 years of industry experience while employed at IBM Research Lab, Almaden in San Jose, California, and Lucent Technologies Bell Labs in Naperville, Illinois. Dr. Rankin completed her PhD in computer science at Northwestern University, her MA in computer science at Kent State University, and her BS in mathematics at Tougaloo College, a historically black college in Jackson, Mississippi. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Rankin, and I hope you all are prepared for a very interesting and exciting presentation. Over to you, Dr. Rankin. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for your hospitality. Thank you for the invitation. I have enjoyed being here for the first time on UNC Charlotte's campus. So I'm delighted that you were able to join me this afternoon and I feel honored to be here with you. So I'm gonna talk about my work, which as the title states, Black Feminist Epistemologies as Critical Frameworks in the Field of Computing. So here's just a roadmap about the topics I'll discuss. Course introduction with the Black Feminist Epistemologies followed with the research interests and then Q&A. So my research lies at the intersection of computer science education research and human computer interaction research. I engage in critical studies of the relationship between people, information, and technology. And these relationships are quite complex oftentimes. I like to think of myself as someone that uses these studies to make visible those structures that deter folks from being included in the field of computing that determine who gets access to technology and who gets to design or even innovate when it comes to technology. I like to think of uh, my work as being essential to the field of intersectional computing. And I'll talk a little bit more about that over the course of the talk this afternoon. But this is a, a quote that I actually like. So Lucy Suchman, she is a renowned techno-feminist in HCI field. And she cites a paper that I co-authored with Chiquita Thomas. It's known as the Straighten Up and Fly Right, Rethinking Intersectionality in HCI. It's an example of what she says of powerful pedagogy in Black feminist theorizing. So I identify as a Black feminist. Today, I'm going to introduce quite a few terms. And so with this glossary, I'm just making you aware of some of the terminology. You can look for definitions throughout the talk. So it's no secret that women are underrepresented in the field of computer science. This pie chart is based on a report from the National Science Foundation that was published back in 2016. It shows here that 82% of the bachelor's degrees in computer science are awarded to men. When we look at women, we see that 8% are awarded to white women with 3% or less awarded to women of color. When I talk about women of color, I'm talking about Latinas as well as black women, Native American women, et cetera. There have been a lot of discussions around why we see this discrepancy when it relates to the gender differences. One is that women are less likely than men to want to major in CS, or women can code, but uh, they just don't want to. 
we see similar narratives applied to Black women in the field of computing. Things such as Black women don't do computing or they're not interested in learning how to code. My personal favorite is there is a shortage of Black women in the computing pipeline. And to that, I respond with this. This diagram is based on data taken from the CRA Talby survey. It's published every year. It gives you a breakdown of the bachelor's, master's, and PhDs in the field of computer science, information systems, and computer engineering. This particular graph is about the number of Black women that are receiving bachelor degrees in computer science. And so just to break this down, from 2013 to 2020, the gold bars represent the number of Black women that come in intending to major in computer science. And you see that the gold bars are steadily increasing. The blue bars represent the number of Black women that are coming out with bachelor's degrees in computer science. And you'll notice that that number seems to be pretty stagnant and consistent. Just to give you more context about what I mean, for the year of 2021, according to the CRA Talby survey, 231 Black women received their bachelor's in computer science. Out of 29,401 degrees that are awarded that year, My research is motivated by applying critical frameworks to understand people. And I think it's important that we apply these critical frameworks so that we can better understand the human condition. I leverage Black feminist epistemologies to shine a light on the lived experiences of historically excluded populations. And when I speak about historically excluded populations, I'm talking about non-dominant populations that have been treated differently because of their race, ethnicity, gender, sexual identity, class, and et cetera. So this is what's motivating the work that I'm currently doing, which focuses on Black women in the field of computing. So I wanna talk a little bit more about what I mean by Black feminist epistemologies. So in Black feminist epistemologies, it's really another way of saying Black women's ways of knowing. And these ways of knowing are based on generation and generation of knowledge that Black women pass down to their daughters and their granddaughters. And so Black women are positioned as agents of knowledge. They're intellectuals, regardless if they have a degree or not. It's this sense of having lived through this life in the United States that's prepared them to be the experts in the room about it, what it means to be a Black woman in the United States. Typically, when we encounter people, we tend to see them along a one dimension. We may notice your gender. We may notice your race, your ethnicity. Well, intersectionality is one of those Black feminist epistemologies. And I say this because intersectionality has been around since the early 19th century. And we can think back to women like Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth who understood deeply that being a Black woman was a very different experience than being a white woman in the United States. And so intersectionality is what helps us to look at things through a lens that helps us to understand the complexity in the world, in people, and in human experiences. It also helps us to understand that we are not one-dimensional people. We're very complex and nuanced human beings. And so my research has focused specifically on race, gender, and class, and the intersection of these three as the lens of which I examine Black women's experiences in the field of computing. For the record, and I know there's been a lot of buzz out in the world and media, a lot of misinformation about what intersectionality is. And so I want to be clear, intersectionality is not a religion. It's not another word for racism. It's not where you are uplifting one group and then putting down another. It's not ethnocentrism. It's not additive, where you just layer one identity, sexuality on top of gender, on top of that. It's much more complex and nuanced than that. In fact, it's quite messy. A lot of this is taken from work that's been done by Patricia Hill Collins, and you can reference her book, 
about intersectionality is a critical social theory published in 2019. She has a new book out, by the way, as well. It just came out. The other Black feminist epistemology that I like to utilize in my work is Black feminist thought. This is also something that was first conceptualized by Patricia Hill Collins. And I like to read this quote because I think it pretty much captures why Black feminist thought is necessary. For African-American women, the knowledge gained at intersecting oppression of race, class, and gender provides the stimulus for crafting and passing on the subjugated knowledge of Black women's critical social theory. As a historically oppressed group, U.S. Black women have produced social thought designed to oppose oppression. It can take the form of poetry, music, essays, and the like, but the purpose of Black women's collective thought is distinctly different. The need for such thought arises because African-American women as a group remain oppressed within a U.S. context characterized by injustice. I also want to point out something else that's important here. If you've ever read the book, you will also come to realize that while this is a critical social theory for understanding Black women experiences and how oppression works, it does not portray Black women as victims. In fact, it speaks to the strength of Black women, our ingenuity, and how we are able to navigate these hostile spaces. And so I want to make sure it's clear to each and every one of you in the room and online that this is not victimhood again. It celebrates the resiliency of Black women, and that is what we want to uphold and focus on here today. I want to go back to this graph. Because this graph is asking us the question, why do the numbers look like this? And this is at the heart of the work that I do. So what do we know about Black women in computing? Well, we do know that gender-focused efforts do not benefit Black women. I have here citations from several papers that will tell you that. Because to ignore race is to make Black women and other women of color invisible. We cannot ignore race and think that by ignoring race, all the issues that come with the idea that one particular race has received privilege and power at the expense of another goes away. We have to be honest and face the fact of what's been happening in not just the United States, United States, but worldwide. The other thing is that there is a different type of racism that women of color experience. It's known as gender racism. And so this is a specific type of racism that says that women of color are treated differently because of their race. Latinas will speak to this. Native American women will speak to this. Asian American women will speak to this. And of course, black women will speak to this. The last thing that we're starting to realize, and it's one that is very much disconcerting for me is the fact that Black women are choosing to leave the field of computing. Think about that graph that I showed you. We'll come back to that point. So what I want to show you today are two specific examples of how I apply Black feminist epistemologies in my research. One, I want to talk about advancing Black women in the field of computing. And two, I want to talk about Black feminist thought as a method for game design as an example of how we can push for equitable design practices in the field of HCI. This work is funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, just letting you know that I like to give, acknowledge my support. So intersectional computing. I mentioned this early in the introduction you're probably wondering, well, is there such a thing? And the answer is yes. We are establishing the foundation for this emerging field. Intersectional computing examines systems of power, how we have these disparities that exist among different populations in the field of computing. And so it's necessary that we provide the tools, the language, the appropriate methodologies, to examine these experiences and to understand so that we're able to create more inclusive, inviting, and supportive spaces, not just for Black women, but for everyone. Now, within the field of CS education, there 
are what I call dominant narratives, myths, if you will. One of them is that, well, CS is colorblind. This idea that if we don't see race, everybody's equal. But as I shared in our precursor session, we know that racism shows up, gender discrimination shows up, sexual oppression shows up as well. When we look at the interactions that we're having, not just on the one-to-one -one level with faculty and friends, but even in the structures that formulate these degree programs. We also know that there's this idea that if you have computer program experience before you get to your four-year college experience, you're going to be great and well-prepared for your CS degree. But my research shows that that's actually not the case, especially for Black women. They talk about experiences where, yes, they've had positive experiences at the high school level with learning about computer science, learning how to program, and then they get to college and it's a very different kind of experience for them in their respective degree programs. So that's not enough either. The other thing is that there's research that says, well, Black women just need to have more social capital, right? Friends and family in the field, and they'll be just perfectly fine with navigating the space. Well, guess what? Black women have friends and family in the field of computing, and even that's not a buffer. And even when they don't, let's understand the history of Black people. In other words, we, of all the people in this particular nation that were brought over as slaves who dealt with enslavement, we understand that we come from places where we may not have the best schools, the best resources. We may not have access to computing technology, but our family and our friends are supportive of us being successful, whether they are in the field or not. So this is not a criteria for black women to be successful or exceed in the field of computing. I'm talking about epistemic power. And epistemic power is really understanding who decides whose knowledge is valued, whose knowledge is validated, whose knowledge counts as acceptable knowledge. And we're pushing against that because Black women's ways of knowing have not been accepted or embraced as being critical to the field of computing. And I'm saying that it should be. So here's the first key takeaway. Center the experiences and amplify the voices of historically excluded populations in computing. This is essential to Black feminist epistemologies. So let's talk about what are those experiences that Black women are having in the field of computing? What are they sharing with us? And this is based on a paper that I wrote with Jaquita Thomas back in 2020. First and foremost, I believe in testimony authority. I believe that it's important that each person has the ability to tell his, her, their story, and that that story should be believed not questioned, not dismissed, and definitely not modified for it to be more palatable to the public. With that being said, I have engaged numerous Black women in the past three years in telling their stories and exercising their testimony authority. I've created a digital repository of now actually more than 55 personal narratives of Black women from diverse backgrounds, some in industry, some entrepreneurs, some in academia, some students like yourselves, who've shared what it's been like to be in the field of computing. I've conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews, and I have conducted 11 sister circles. And sister circles is actually some of the work that is coming out of my early career war. It's a new methodology, a new intersectional methodology for how we understand Black women's experiences. So I'm going to share an excerpt based on um, Renee, and this is a pseudonym, who talks about her experience. So that's, I guess, one thing about HBCU. It wasn't a competitive environment, but more a collaborative environment. So classmates didn't compete with one another, but they did work together to better understand and work on assignments and things like that. And there was a lot of mentoring and guidance in that whole process in undergrad. 
So they were set on mentoring, open door. You can go to any professor. They read your college applications and that sort of thing. No TAs to go through or anything like that. It was a really open sort of environment. People weren't afraid to ask questions and say they didn't know something and learn something. So when I first came to the PWI, they automatically started off as a very competitive environment for their students. Nobody wants to admit when they don't know something and that sort of thing. What Renee is testifying to is the difference between her experience as a black woman in the field of computing, comparing her undergraduate experience at the HBCU versus her graduate experience at the PWI. She's not the only one that testifies to these kinds of experiences. And so we were able to basically abstract what are those influences that are positive in women's ability to persist in the field versus those that hinder their ability to persist in the field. And so for the HBCUs, Black women consistently talked about this being a supportive learning environment, a sense of community, family, a collaborative culture with mentorship and guidance. But they also talked about having high expectations. Their professors expected them to work hard and to deliver. On the other hand, when they talked about their experiences at PWIs, they talked about the culture being apathetic as it related to them being there. No sense of community, very competitive culture, lack of mentorship or guidance, and people didn't expect them to do very well or to excel or stand out. Now, this caused me to wanna to take a step back and, and think about that while I'm engaging them and telling their stories, and I want to understand what are those social factors that are contributing to their persistence in the field, I began to realize that we really didn't have appropriate tools for how to understand how these systems of oppression work and how black women resist these systems. And so my next takeaway is that there is a distinct difference between studies of intersectional populations versus intersectional studies. This one's actually quite important because this is where I find myself currently grappling with. And I'll repeat it because it's very important. There is a distinct difference between studies of intersectional populations versus intersectional studies. And you're probably wondering, what do I mean by that? This is what I mean by that. So I've been doing research, oh my gosh, for a long time. Um, I've worked with different populations. I've worked with black youth, elementary students, middle school, high school. I've worked with college students. I've talked to black women professionals. And in doing this work, I've had to take a critical eye to even the work that I do, the research that I initially started doing and how I began to grow and evolve. And I will be honest in telling you that my first initiation to doing this kind of work, I was actually doing a study of intersectional populations. And that's a hard truth, but it's one that I have to acknowledge because if you are really serious about inclusion, equity, social justice, then you have to start with self. And so as a researcher, what I would do is I would position the people that I'm working with, human subjects, as objects of study, rather than engaging them as collaborators and partners in this research experience. My research agenda, because I've been trained as a researcher how to conduct a study, right? There's a research protocol. I have an IRB consent form. I've got a research question, and these are the methods that we're going to use to help us answer the question. But the reality is how beneficial is that to the very population that I say that I wanna help? And so what I had to do was take a step back and recognize that instead of me coming in with my own research agenda, I actually need to build relationship with the communities, not to study them, but to learn from them. 
when you begin to do the work from the lens of I'm here to learn from you, think back to what I said about Black women as agents of knowledge. This applies to any population. Then all of a sudden you have a very, very different paradigm that's driving your research. And so now I realize I can learn from them. And not only that, I am no longer the expert in the room. They are. And so the research questions together we formulate. So this is in direct contrast to how we've been trained. Anybody in this room knows this, how we've been trained as researchers in the field. But this is the work that's required when you're working with intersectional populations, if your goal is to do an intersectional study. And so having appropriate methods are critical for doing that. And so this is a process. It's one which I'm still going through and I'm learning. And I've made mistakes and I still make mistakes. But rather than positioning myself as someone, again, as the expert in the room, I'm here to learn from them. And so it requires much self-reflexivity. And I engage in that quite a bit. And so I invite you uh, on this journey, if you're interested in doing similar work, to look at what I point out as being crucial to intersectional studies. This idea that the target population are agents of knowledge, they're intellectuals, acknowledging and embracing the social cultural norms and practices and language as assets, not deficiencies. That power relations must be acknowledged and dissected for understanding. And that I have to acknowledge what my agenda is openly. And in doing so, be willing to take a step back from that if it's in the disadvantage the population that I'm working with. And so that means their greater good is more important than my research agenda. So this is very different from how we're taught and trained. So let's talk about saturated sites of power. These are practices, social institutions, representations. They are bonded together. They represent everyday social interactions. They appear to be separate, but they actually mutually influence one another and become this convoluted systems of oppression. And so this caused me to ask the question about epistemic power and Black women in the field of computing and what do these saturated sites look like? And in doing so, I, along with my colleagues, Jaquita Thomas and Sheena Arete, developed an intersectional analysis of power as the methodology for dissecting the structures of oppression. And so this is a five-step process. One, we have to identify who holds power. Two, what are the inner workings of power? Three, what are the intersecting systems of power? Because there's more than one. Four, what are the outcomes? And then five, how did the person resist? So in our findings, we identified three primary locations in CS education for saturated sites of um, violence, and we found traditional K through 12 classrooms, predominantly white institutions, and internships as supplementary learning experiences. I'm going to focus on PWIs because that's where we are today. I'm going to share with you Ashley's account of her experience. And by the way, Ashley is uh, a graduate student at the time that we're having this conversation, and she received her undergraduate degree from this institution, went on to be accepted into their graduate program. And so that's the context in which Ashley's talking about her experience. I wasn't really kissing up to the right people, even though I had been doing research since I got there. I was seeing other people getting invited into these labs and I wasn't. That kind of made me feel like, well, maybe people just don't want me to work with them. Maybe they don't think I'm smart enough. I just thought, okay, if I take your class, if I do well, you know, if I'm telling you that I'm interested and I'm talking to you, that that will get me an invite. And that just wasn't so. So she's talking about this experience where, again, she's a product of this undergraduate degree program. She's interested in robotics. And so she's working in this, her advisor is, has a, a robotics lab and he's, she's even taken his class and she meets with him regularly. She's expressed her interest 
Meanwhile, he's inviting other students to come work with him in his research lab. She's not getting that invite. Now, the thing that's disturbing about this story is that Ashley ended up withdrawing from that graduate program. Here's the power analysis. Who holds power? Computer science faculty. If you don't know by now, when you are a, especially a graduate student, we discuss our students. We discuss your progress. In fact, there may be a document report about your year to year progress. So we are the ones that hold the power in this situation. The inner workings of power, well, it's made visible through the lack of invitation that's extended to her to join the research lab, even though she's been very explicit about her interest in robotics and her advisor is the person that's running the lab. What are the intersecting systems of power? Well, racism, sexism. Uh, yes, yeah, she's the only black female in that program. Hegemony, the culture, in terms of who's fit to be in that lab or a part of that research environment. What are the outcomes? Surveillance. I mean, she's constantly being surveyed. That's what we do, right? And the other outcome is that she doesn't get to engage in research. And this is a problem because as you know, as graduate students, you cannot make progress if you don't engage in research. So what is she supposed to do? That's why her resistance was actually leaving the program. Now I can gladly say years later, she ended up enrolling somewhere else. But think about that. She decided to leave. What if she hadn't tried again? So that's what I mean by black women are leaving the program, sometimes for their mental health. And that's important. It's also an act of resistance. And that's the point that I also want to point out. So in doing this work, what did we learn? Well, we learned that violence, and yes, this is violence, and CS education is constant, and it occurs at every level for Black women. We know that CS education is a matrix of intersecting oppressions for Black women computing. It shows up in different ways, because we conducted this intersectional power analysis on multiple, multiple accounts that Black women shared with us. Uh, and we also learned that Black women are leaving the field as an act of resistance. I think I've covered most of these terms, but I'm happy to share the slides with you later if you would like. So while I've talked about, you know, Black women's epistemologies and advancing Black women representation, I want to uh, shift gears just a little bit and now talk about how this work informs what I do with equitable design practices. So I mentioned that, um, I do research at HCI. I didn't tell you how I got my PhD. My PhD is actually on gaming. And so it was a dare that a colleague of mine at Microsoft Research was telling me that he was playing World of Warcraft and learning Spanish. And I didn't believe him. I said, get out of here, you can't, you can't learn a language playing that game. He said, yes, I can. And so he, he dared me to do this study. And it just so happens at the time, I had a contact at Sony online entertainment. They gave me free licenses for EverQuest 2. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but that's also a massive multiplayer game. Maybe not as popular as, as World of Warcraft, but it is. But with these free licenses, I actually did a study looking at uh, English as second language students interacting with native English speakers in this virtual environment and seeing how it could possibly contribute to their proficiency in English literacy skills, specifically vocabulary acquisition, reading comprehension. And we found that the interactions were crucial to their ability to improve or increase the vocabulary acquisition. However, if they were left on their own to play in this virtual environment, and even though other players would approach them for social interactions, they would not engage with them and you would not see that learning outcome where they increase their English vocabulary. So it was, really, it was the social interactions. The other thing about this study was that they were not asking native English speakers for definitions of anything. It was the interactions themselves that provided sufficient context for them to actually understand what the words meant. If you're wondering what kind of words, words like parchment, coagulate. So I'm not talking about ghosts and goblins. I'm talking about academic words, right? Now, I did that for my PhD. That was really fun. 
So I got a chance to play games for, for, for my thesis, but it led to me doing some other interesting things around gaming. And I thought about uh, when I was playing games for fun, um, how many other black women were playing games? And I really didn't know. I didn't see any research out there that talked about black women playing games. Women, yes, yes, some, but definitely nothing about black women. And so I, I saw this as an opportunity to understand what were the trends and practices for black women in gaming. And so I, I did this project um, and I co-authored a paper with a PhD student, India Irish. She's no longer a PhD student, thank God. She just defended. But we did a study in which we engaged Black women to not only play games, but to create games. And so the whole idea was, again, Black feminist epistemologies, in this case, Black feminist thought, being the framework for how we design this game. And this, is, this work is about that. So first, let's take a step back. So we know that games can be instrumental in supporting different aspects of second language learning. And L2 stands for second language learning. It's ideal for vocabulary acquisition, it's ideal for reading comprehension. Not so good for spelling, though. You can think about how you chat. We do a lot of abbreviations. Not good for that. Uh, the other thing is that when it comes to conversation, unless you're dealing with voice over IP interactions during game, it's not as useful for that. Chat-based interactions to some degree, but definitely not the kind of conversational fluency that we expect in spoken interactions. We also, in our study, realized that a lot of games that are pretty popular for recreation don't portray black women in a positive light. They tend to portray us in a negative light. They tend to be hypersexualized, things of that sort. Or the storylines for us are not as rich and nuanced. They're more one dimensional and again, not very complimentary. So there's very little research about black women's gay play experiences. So we had this idea that, you know, there's gotta be a way that we could center the experiences of black women, engage them as creators of games, as well as consumers of games. And so we wanted to, to understand how we could leverage black feminist epistemologies in doing so. So here on the screen, you see our uh, Spanish instructor. She was the person that was the expert in understanding how students who are new or who are novices in learning Spanish need support and helping us to attend to the pedagogical strategies that we used in our, in our game design. But she's just one member of the team. So we had our Spanish language learning expert. We had black women who had a sincere desire to learn how to create games. And most were CS majors, but that was not a requirement. It was all about interest. And we're talking about low fidelity prototyping. So we're removing barriers of entry so that anyone can play in this space, okay? And with that being said, we came up with this idea that, hey, um, we're going to create this game and I love food. So we ended up thinking about a, a, a game that had a food theme to it, all right? And we selected different recipes and we're focusing on Spanish. So Spanish is the language of choice. At the time, I was teaching at Spelman College. And so they had this two-year foreign language proficiency requirement. The majority of students took Spanish. So it just made sense to do Spanish. This is the low fidelity prototype. And it was actually developed and it was something that you could play on your iPhone. It's meant to be crude. So I'm not surprised if you're looking like, huh, oh, it's not all that. Yeah, it's not the point. When we are working with uh, a population such as black women, and you're talking about creating a level playing field so they can actually create technology, you wanna make this so that the entry, there's no barrier for entry. And so with that being said, they need something that they can see, that they can relate to, that also sends the message, it's not a finished product. Because the more polished something is, research has taught us that people don't wanna criticize. They don't wanna make changes because they think it's finished, right? They don't wanna touch it. But if something looks like this, then they realize, well, there's a lot of room for improvement and I can contribute to this in a meaningful way. And so this is what you're seeing. Sophia is our character, our main character. We support it not just being able to read, but to hear uh, the English as well as the Spanish version of what was said. There's the recipe of a strawberry cake and the game was scaffolded so that you only had to select one ingredient at a time from two ingredients, right? So they would see a list of ingredients beforehand. They would see the recipe and it's sort of like a, a recall kind of game, if you will. Well, you can imagine what the feedback was from our, from our team. 
And so what we did in week six is we had a group of, of black women on this campus come to the computer lab and, and play the game on their iPhones. They would download the game, play the game, and then they would give us feedback. And we told them off the bat, this is not a finished product. It's just a concept. We really want your input. Please, we're open to any feedback you can give us. And they gave us plenty. First thing they said, this is not a game. They're like, this, I don't know what this is. This is not a game. And that's okay. And so they have very very clear ideas about how to make this more uh, authentically and culturally correct or appropriate so that students would want to play it and perhaps learn some Spanish vocabulary in the process. We record the play test sessions in which they engaged with us and provided feedback. And um, we were able to, from there, come up with new design modifications to the game. So this is what they told us they wanted. They wanted intersectional game characters. They wanted culturally authentic game scenarios. They talked about self-definition. I'm not gonna talk about self-definition because I'm pretty sure I'm going over time already, but here we go. So this is what they meant by um, include intersectional game characters. And the reason why I use their quotes, if you remember, I believe in testimony authority. So I like to amplify their voices. Well, in this case, read their, their, their experiences. There are black Spanish people. And I feel like there is never any representation of them so I think that would be interesting. So the point that this, this student is making is she's saying, look, I mean, when people think about learning Spanish, they don't think about black Spanish people, but we exist, we are in the world. Why is that the case? And so you need to show the variety and show that black people speak Spanish. This, this shouldn't be an anomaly. This shouldn't be unusual, this should be the norm. So here we are in this experience and Jennifer is sharing this with us. And so we took our advice. This is um, one of the later versions of the mobile prototype. And this again is, is available uh, on your phone. The idea is we have these different profiles now for different characters. And so I do not speak Spanish. I can tell you this now, but welcome to my kitchen. Bienvenidos, I'm Casina. Welcome to my kitchen. You have the option of seeing Anything that someone says, hearing it in English as well as Spanish. You have the menu where you can choose Me Maker, where you can choose your facial features. Choose a chef. That's the chef that's going to guide you in making the recipe and then the Spanish cuisine challenge. So it's about Spanish dishes. And what we learn to do in providing these intersectional game characters is we actually met with women who were from these respective countries. It was fun. And so I had a chance to meet a woman named Amara. And though her hometown is Miami, Florida, she's actually from Panama. Spanish is her home language. And she gave me the context for thinking about this backstory for who Amara was. You also have on the far right, Melissa, who is from Colombia. And so we met with someone that was from Colombia. And so this, this allowed me to understand, once again, thinking about who gets to design games, who makes the decisions, these create decisions about the kind of characters that are in these games. It's often not women of color. And so I really enjoyed having this experience and opportunity to step outside my comfort zone and to meet and interact with women who are from other places in the world that are native Spanish speakers. Just thought I share that with you. The other thing that uh, they told us they wanted was culturally authentic game scenarios. And so Keisha says, provide setting that resembles true locations to teach the geography of Spanish speaking country of the learned language. And so what she was saying was, you've got this context where you want people to engage in learning the different ingredients, the Spanish vocabulary for specific cuisine, but it has no context, it's whitewashed. You need to change that, right? It needs to reflect the appropriate culture. It needs to have the music. And she talked about that. And so what you have here is um, Amara, and we have more of a backstory for her. And there's this ingredient um, that she's got a list for making dolce fria. I don't know if you can see that in the circle here, but it's a dish that is specific to um, not just Panamanian, but it's specific to two different Spanish cuisines, but they make it differently depending on where you're from, right? It's almost this thing about beans. I don't know if any of you noticed, beans served in Puerto Rico 
are not the same beans in Mexico, they're not the same beans in Panama. So same thing here, understanding those cultural nuances. And so this is, was important for us to reflect that. It also made it easier to create game content because now you have the same vocabulary words being repeated, but just a different steps in the ingredients. So it helps the scaffolding again, learning. So when we talk about equitable design practices, we're really talking about one, utilizing safe spaces within the black community. Think about who gets access and determining who designs technology, in this case, who designs games. Do it within the black community. Don't have people go to your lab. What is that? Two, position black women as agents of knowledge and collaborators in the design process. And we really worked hard to do that. Uh, engage black women in dialogic interactions to understand their unique perspectives. So I could have done a survey, which would have been the easy way out. But actually the way that you uncover what really needs to be done is having those conversations. And by the way, it's common to have conflicting feedback. Well, how do you reconcile that? Through conversations, you find out what's really most important and crucial to your designing your, in this case, your game characters. But you can't get that from a survey. And so by engaging them as in conversations, they are, really are collaborators and partners in this process of designing this technology. And then last but not least, including nuanced intersectional game characters. And again, having the opportunity to pull their women of color from around the world in this process. It's a great opportunity. One that I wish that more gaming companies would do in the real world. All right, so takeaways, just revisiting, center the experiences and amplify the voices of historically excluded populations in the design process. And two, there is a difference between intersectional studies of intersectional populations and intersectional studies. So I'll take q and I'd love to give a shout out to all the people that helped me do my work because I would be nothing without them. These are some of my collaborators in recent years and I can't thank them enough. And of course, again, this work is funded by the National Science Foundation. And so I'll take any, any questions you may have at this time. And before uh, I forget, this is the uh, QR code for the survey. So we are asking you to please complete the survey. We, we need the feedback. And so if you would take the time to do that, it should be available to those of you who are also online as well. And Yolanda, tell anybody online they can put their questions in the chat. Yes, and anyone who's online, please feel free to list your questions in the chat and we will address them. And fill out the survey. Too. Yes, and <laughs> the survey. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Jennifer. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you. That's my classmate, y'all from Northwestern, believe it or not. <laughs> I'm going to get a sip of my Coke to keep me awake. Any questions? Any comments? Yes. I have a question. I, to be very, first of all, thank you for coming. This was wonderful. Um, at the beginning, when you were talking about the enrollment rates and then the, the graduation rates, and we have certain programs that target females um, in in computer science and and engineering do have in some of the research you've done do have you found that some of those organizations have been helpful in keeping women uh, in computing or even attracting more women to computing I, I think when we look at we especially when we're talking about um, underrepresentation in computing that, that primarily most of the um, work will focus on women in computing. Absolutely. I think the field is more comfortable with acknowledging that we have an issue with gender, right? Mm -hmm. But when you start talking about the issue of race and gender, then there's a people in our field mm -hmm. are uncomfortable comfortable with that. So I will tell you that, that uh, in some of the data that I've collected, Black women very much do talk about some of these organizations being helpful. And they will talk about the fact that they've had people who explicitly went out of their way to make sure that they felt welcome. The issue, and I'll give this example because this is one that I lived through. <laughs> so the issue is that um, 
when someone says we are committed to increasing the number of women, because they don't think that there's a difference or distinction between Black women, Native mm -hmm. American, Latinas, mm -hmm. et cetera, they think that it, it covers everyone. And it may look nice for their numbers to lump everybody as one, like, oh, well, we're just going to count all women the same. But the experiences are not the same. So I was at Grace Hopper. Oh, God. It's the last time I, I went to Grace Hopper. So this would have been maybe 2015, maybe 2016. Um, I can't remember exactly. But does anybody not know what Grace Hopper is? Raise your hand and I'll explain. Okay. So Grace Hopper is this conference that focuses on women in computing. It's every year, typically in Florida. I think every now and then they'll move it sometimes to Houston, but it, it tends to find its way back to Florida. Uh, but the point is, it's a conference that celebrates the diversity of women. It has workshops, seminars that focus on, like, say, how to navigate industry. There's an on-site job fair, graduate school, all these things to help support women being successful in the space. And women from around the world, by the way, attend this conference. Well, this particular year, uh, you have different um, groups that will have, like, a, a reception, if you will. And so um, the Black Women in Computing had a reception, a reception with no food, mm. no drink. Okay. We were in this hotel lobby area. So I look across the way and I see the Latinas over there with food and drink. So we look at our table, which is bare. We look across the way, food and drink. We get our table, which is bare across the way so i asked i said how come we don't have any food or what we couldn't get we couldn't get a sponsor you couldn't get a sponsor yeah they didn't want to sponsor us who would you ask now i'm not gonna name any names but you can imagine at this conference we have all the big names we have the googles we have the microsofts we have the amazons mm. couldn't get a sponsor huh okay all right so i walked away from that experience going so i guess the flavor of the day was latinas and not black women Nobody wanted to sponsor us. Now, by the way, we had numbers there. And so it caused me, and I admit I have not been back, but it caused me to write about it. I wrote about it from the standpoint of apparently industry didn't think that they needed to support Black women in this space. I don't know why. Mm. Never received an explanation, but it was telling that they had money for other groups and no money for us. This is what I mean by we're not all having the same experience. You can't lump us all in the group, mm -hmm. same group. So yes, these efforts don't necessarily target Black women. When they don't target Black women, they're ineffective for Black women. So you may be helping a handful of Black women here and there, but overall, you're not doing anything that's making substantial change for the population in general. And that's what the problem is. That's why those gender-focused efforts are ineffective, because you're not acknowledging that there's differences. Some people, and again, I like the flavor of the day theme because one season you're in, one season you're not. Um, Black women live with this every day, mm -hmm. whether we're in season or not. <laughs> Black people live with this every day, whether we're in season or not. So we need efforts that are going to be sustainable for the long term, not a one time, be me, you know, refreshment strength. We need some, we need commitment for the long haul. So. Yes. So they do affect here and there, but not on a large scale. Not on a large scale. Thank you. That's why we have Black Computer. Shout out. <laughs> uh, come check it out. <laughs> Questions? Yes. So Hello, been, Dr. Sue. Hi. <laughs> so I've been to conferences, and um, a lot of people do ask for advice, especially at uh, faculty, CS faculty, and at PWIs, because we know the hiring practices in, in those departments are typically not very diverse. And sometimes it's a challenge for them, supposedly, you know, to uh, create spaces. But what would be your advice to those departments that say they don't really know how to create the spaces um, that, for the, uh, you know, women, uh, Black women in their departments? So I tell, um, I, I often advise people to work with organizations that are already centering and making space for Black women. Yeah. And the reason why I made a shout out to Black Computer, that's actually one of the things that they do. And so 
one of the ways that the department could make space and showing that they are supportive of black women being in the field of computing is send their students to the conference. Mm -hmm. Because I assure you that conference is a safe space for black women again from diverse backgrounds to come together and talk about the challenges of navigating this field. So that's one way because you don't have to recreate the wheel and you probably don't even have the resources internally to do that. The other thing is to be very vocal in public and acknowledging that you are committed to Black women and that you want to see Black women in your program succeed. And so bring in Black women to your program as speakers, hire Black women as faculty. These are things that you do have the power to control and do. And again, you should be supporting any initiative that's focusing on the uplift of Black people. So I know some of you know about Tapia, of course there's Nesby, but you can work with these organizations to do that. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a, oh, I don't know what to do, I'm lost. There are organizations that are already doing this. Also look at the, the universities that have been successful in implementing these programs. There are some that, that model this very well. Now, I will tell you, Dr. Stoops, that one of the initiatives that Black Computer has taken on recently is actually identifying those graduate programs that are supportive of Black women. Mm -hmm. I advise you, if you're thinking about graduate school, especially if you're going somewhere else other than UNC Charlotte, you might want to connect to that. Mm -hmm. I think that's necessary because when we don't know, um, you're just at a disadvantage. You should, we should have the kind of resources where you know this institution is a great place for me to go and get my degree. They're supportive. I can get through the program. They want me there. They're, they're, they're going to make sure, they're going to invest in me. They want to see me succeed. So those are things that you can do. That's a start. And then, of course, you have the BRSN. So um, you can model your program after BRSN. That's another thing. That's our goal, to disseminate mm -hmm. the information. Exactly. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, I'll just add a comment because everything that you said just brought me back to um, Trevor Noah when he did his sign off from The Daily Show. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going back to his quote because I looked it up so I may make sure I remember. He said, I've often been credited with having these grand ideas. People say, oh, Trevor, you're smart. I'm like, who do you think teaches me? Who do you think shaped me, nourished me, and formed me? From my mom, grandma, my aunt, all these Black women in my life, but in America as well. He said, if people want to learn about America, talk to Black women, because unlike anybody, everybody else, Black women can't afford to F around and find out. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Any other questions? Comments? I have a question. Oh. Ah! Dr. Oops. Washington. I'm sorry, I wasn't on well, my voice. No. <laughs> well, actually, um, from your time working at an HBCU, um, I guess my question springs off of that with like the power structures that exist between the students and then also the faculty. Um, do you have any, I guess, similarities that kind of translated over in your observations with the game playing and stuff like that? Um, Ed Spellman. Um, in relation to being at HBCU? So, you no, know, that's a great question, Dr. Washington. I was, I was reflecting on um, just now my experiences as Spelman. I, I, I let me first, first of all say that I learned probably so much more from the students I taught at Spelman than they did from me. Um, those Black women got me together. And what I mean by that is, you know, this generation is very vocal whether it's via social media or y'all, you know how y'all get together and y'all write up a letter and say what you need to say about uh, your particular department or what you think the department should be doing. But I appreciate that. I appreciate that, that willingness to be open and sharing. And so this is uh, Dr. Washington where I refer to some of the things I did incorrectly, where the motivation was coming from, because at that time I was really focused on um, getting tenure and trying to get publications out, right? And so I definitely positioned uh, the work that I was doing with, I know with the Black youth at that time, because I was doing game workshops and things like that as objects of study, I had to learn, uh, I had to unlearn what I had learned. 
um, from being trained as a scientist. And so the power structure for me was understanding how I as a, a faculty member could walk into a classroom and really have the power to determine which of my students would succeed and not succeed. And what it caused me to understand was that I could create barriers to a student succeeding in my class, or I could redesign my class so that I remove those barriers. Not saying the student didn't have to work hard, but instead of making things um, a certain way, I, can, I could make it where the student could excel if, if I really was about the, the essence of learning. So what I mean by that is one of my best instructors at Northwestern was this instructor. He didn't have any deadlines. He, all the assignments were available from day one. You could, it was a coding class. It was my intro to AI class. You could work as far ahead as you wanted to. He had test cases. You ran your code against his test cases. You could accept your grade as it was, or if you want to go back and redo it and get a higher grade, that was entirely up to you. That's the way he ran his class. Now, he lectured moving forward throughout the textbook, regardless of where you were. So I learned that if I really wanted to master a particular concept, to go back and take the time to get a better grade and do it right and pass all the test cases and go see him in his office literally almost every day. I learned because it's important to learn how to code in LISP. That was hard for me because I was, I had been trained from procedural mindset. So it's a very different kind of way of thinking. I have never seen a class like that. Now, he's been doing this for years. So I'm sure the grading for him, coding is an easy thing to redo because you've got test cases but you can imagine a class where it's not just coding, it's really a lot of extra work for the faculty member, but it's worth it. And so what I'm saying is I learned to give tests and if my students didn't score, like say a 75 or, or better, what I would tell them is go back and rework the problems that you missed. I can't give you full credit, but I can increase your grade if you show me that you, you corrected what you did wrong because it was about the learning. It was more work for me though. And so this is where I got the pushback and started thinking about the ways that the, my style of teaching was creating barriers. If I say, and this is an introductory programming class. So this is where I can lose the women. And by the way, initially, even at Spelman, we were losing a third of our majors in these classes. So that's why I had to take a step back. And so I ended up finding common ground around food. I told you I love food. <laughs> so we started doing this, um, this, um, it's all in the mix and I can't take full credit for it. Uh, Dr. Chiquita Thomas really was the, the one that came up with it and then I helped her uh, work through it. But we use food as a common ground. So for the first few weeks of the class, I didn't teach programming, I taught algorithms and I did it through recipes. And so we would have food activities like um, make my dessert. I'm a, also a fan of cooking shows. And so just like the back of the room has all these in, uh, food back there, they would have a list of ingredients and they would have like a minute to go back there and look at the ingredients, come back to their team and then come up with a unique dessert recipe. And then in five minutes, make it and write it out. That's why it was a team effort because you needed somebody to be writing at the same time that you're making it. You might make a few mistakes and then taste it. And then we would have, to, I mean, that's just one example. So the food was the common ground. It was a, a place where everybody could relate to. It was a starting point. And recipes, they pretty much had some, some knowledge of what a recipe was. And so this is what I mean by re rethinking how I taught, removing barriers, uh, which might create a little bit of work. This one I may work for me though, I have to admit I did. Uh, we also had other food activities. So we created a whole food module ar around those first three weeks of classes to get them thinking algorithms first and then coding second, because algorithms is actually the skill that's going to translate to whatever you're doing in STEM. Even if you decide not to be a CS major, it will serve you well. And that was successful in keeping more of our students in the class throughout the semester. Even when they had a C at midterm, they would stay in the class and pull, and pull it out. They would pull it out. So like I said, I learned so much more from those students than they probably learned from me. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. But uh, Dr. Washington, I hope I answered your question. So the power structure for me is understanding how to use my power and privilege to benefit my students so that they're willing to do the work, to be inspired, encouraged, rather than feeling discouraged and told that they can't do it and this is not for them and they should go somewhere else. So I, I, I I didn't use words and phrases like CS is not for you. I think that should be the student's choice. I don't need to say that. 
ever, right? And so this, this is some of the education uh, that happened for me being at, at Spelman College that I still carry on today. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Let me check the chat, make sure I'm not slacking. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Rankin. This was very, very interesting. Um, I really enjoyed it. And so let's thank Dr. Rankin. And thank you to everybody who joined us online. Um, hopefully you filled out the survey. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.